Hello to everybody. I am so fortunate, Patrick Newton with IICLE, to be here with two really true legends uh, in the Chicago area. Terry Hake is an internal investigations with the Cook County Sheriff's Office, and he was with the FBI. But prior to that, Terry was the main instrument in um, the Greylord corruption scandal back in the uh, 1970s. And, uh, and without Terry, there probably uh, wouldn't have been 103 different people indicted and sent to jail, judges, lawyers, uh, courtroom personnel, et cetera, et cetera, because Terry played the role of, as the main undercover person for the government and the FBI in that particular case. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Patrick. And then I've got, of course, John Drummond, who everybody knows, legendary for his journalistic skills and crime here in Chicago. He's the bulldog, and I'm here with the bulldog and Terry to talk a little bit about Illinois corruption, the culture of it, and uh, hopefully a little bit about what went on in Gray Lawrence how that affected you in your life, Terry, um, what you knew about that during your time uh, starting off here in Chicago as a journalist as well, John. So, Terry, we'll start with you first. Um, this had to be a life-changing experience for you. Absolutely, Patrick. Uh, I'm still living it today. I gave a presentation this morning on law enforcement ethics and tying it into Greylord. When you, you know, when you made that decision, you were just a young man. That must have been a really complex, difficult uh, situation for you to be in. Well, it was and it wasn't. Uh, as you said, I was a young man, so in that regard, it wasn't uh, too hard of a decision. I wasn't married. I didn't have any children. I was 28 years old, living at home with my parents in the northwest suburbs of Chicago. So it sounded kind of exciting. I don't know if which came first, the chicken or the egg, but uh, I was kind of in a perfect place and at a perfect time in my life, too in that I had applied for the FBI. I had an application in. So when they found me, I was the perfect candidate uh -huh. in this perfect storm. Um, let's talk a little bit about, you know, you were, were here in Chicago when the Grey Lord was breaking, uh, right. uh, and you were mentioning some things about how uh, it was kind of groundbreaking, even what you were doing in television in those that's, days. That's correct. Going back to that period, in the 70s, of course, there was lots of rumors that there was corruption in the judicial system. That had gone back beyond the, that goes back to the 20s probably. I can recall one case where an individual I knew was charged with drunken driving. And he told me that uh, he needed to get out of it because I think it was his third charge, but he said it was good. He, he went to a lawyer, an experienced lawyer. He said, it'll cost you $1,000 to fix it. That was the type of culture, the type of people that took that for granted. That's how you did business in Cook County. And these rumors continued to exist. And of course, it was the story started to leak and was broken in 1981 when there was uh, some stations covered it, and the newspapers started leaking it. And then finally, in December 1983, came the indictments came down. And this was a very major news story. This is a time, of course, December is normally not a big news month, but that really, that was a blockbuster. The question was, who, what judges are going to be indicted? Who's next? And so on and so forth. How far did the corruption go? Was it just down in traffic court? Was it, uh, did it go up what they call the fourth floor, the 26th and Cal, where the felony cases were being? These are some of the questions that were being asked at that time, and they soon were being answered. Terry, one of the things, of course, one of the individuals that Terry had a lot of dealings with was Judge Wayne Olson at 26 in California. He was the first judge, to, to my knowledge, who ever had his, his chambers bugged by federal authorities. In other words, a wire was put in there so they could listen in to what Olson was saying. That's accurate, John. Uh, uh, judges' chambers had never been it's bugged before. They could never touch that. That was sacrosanct. In the United States, it was such a serious decision that myself and the U.S. Attorney at that time, Tom Sullivan, and Dan Reedy, the, the architect of Greylord, we flew to Washington. They wanted to see who I was, who was, su who was supplying the probable cause to say money was exchanging hands in Judge Olson's chambers. And so after I met with uh, William Webster, the head of the FBI, and the chief of the criminal division of the Department of Justice, they then signed off on their part of uh, bugging the chain. I recall talking to a veteran uh, defense attorney, a well-known criminal lawyer who's now deceased, uh, at the 26th in California. He said, Drummond, something's big's coming down. He said, they're, they're going to crack down on a lot of judges. He said, he was, he had already talked about there was corruption down there. And of course, this, this time it's for real. There was always these rumors, but a lot of people couldn't believe how big this was. There could be that many judges on the take. It was right. very hard to believe. Right. But. You know, Terry, could you believe that? I mean, one of the reasons I'm sure you made this move, uh, this, and as John said, what a fantastically brave move it was, but it was because you really couldn't tolerate what you saw that was going on. Right. Uh, I first made my complaint after working in the murder, rape, and child molestation courtroom at 26 in California. Branch 66 is the, 
the name of it. It's still there to this day. And in that courtroom, all the murders, rapes, and child molestations from the entire city of Chicago are heard at the preliminary hearing level. And in those days, there were seven, 800 murders a year in Chicago. And the rumor in that courtroom was that the judge's bailiff, Lucius Robinson, sat in the jury box during a preliminary hearing. That was a signal to the judge, Maurice Pompey, they're both dead now, so I can mention their names. <laughs> and that was a signal to Judge Pompey that Lucius had received the money from the defense attorney, and Pompey could throw the murder, rape, or child molestation case out. Well, it was a great story, uh, but they didn't have to go to those extremes. But there's no doubt in my mind that they were fixing cases. I mean, how do you, uh, you know, when, you're, when you first started that, you, you couldn't just walk in there and say, I take bribes or something, right? I mean, how did you, how, how difficult was it for you to get your foot in the door to become trusted in, in terms of the, joining that fraternity, if, for lack of a better word? Yeah, it, w it wasn't easy, Patrick. Uh, one thing that I did have going for me is I had worked in the system for three years, so a lot of defense lawyers knew me, right. judges knew me. As a matter of fact, my first fix was in front of John Dollars Divine. And uh, I went up to a defense attorney that I knew and I said, hey, I wanna you know, fix this drunken driving case with Divine and can you help me or should I see this uh, Chicago policeman who I've heard is his bag man? We had heard that from this fellow Costello. And uh, this defense lawyer says, well, you know, Divine, just go talk to him yourself. So it took a lot of uh, gumption to do that, but I went up to him and uh, said, uh, Judge Devine, I've got a case in your courtroom and I need some help. He said, uh, no problem. The guy you need to see is going to be down here in a minute. And Devine introduced me to the bag man, to the bag man. Harold Kahn. And uh, so after working oh, with Harold... Appropriately Har named. Yeah. <laughs> yeah <Kahn Man. laughs> Harold Kahn, Shelly Sarosky, Bulgojevich's lawyer, represented Harold at trial. Uh, but, uh, you know, and then from there, Harold... Uh, told me he was working a deal with with a couple policemen who were bag men named the Trunzo brothers yep. and because they knew the judge I was trying to fix with better than he did so then one day when Harold wasn't looking I struck up a conversation with one of the one of the Trunzo brothers and started paying them started off, paying them off. What they were the, identical twins all of these judges most of them anyway that were taking the bribes apparently had a lifestyle that their, their income from being a judge wasn't enough. They, 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 particularly in Judge Holzer's case, I know along with his wife, they had a very, very uh, expensive lifestyle. Right, they lived on East, East Lakeshore exactly. Drive, which, was, which is the address in Chicago. Uh, they had yes. places in uh, Lake Delavan and Lake Geneva. and Exactly, right. yep. Patrick. A lot of them, it seemed to me, uh, had drinking problems, too. Yeah, Divine did, I know, and I think Olson might have, too. Yeah, Divine, Olson, uh, the, a lot of them had girlfriends, too, uh, other than their wives. Uh, so they did live these lifestyles uh, that uh, required a lot of money. Lefevre had five sons that he was putting through fine colleges. Uh, that may have driven him. Uh, so they lived uh, lifestyles that... Uh, could not be supported by a, ju a judicial income, even though they were good w incomes. Of course, did this Greylord investigation here, did that help any other communities, perhaps? I don't know. On, on, on well, charges, there was... Uh, since it was sort of uh, I know of that uh, Philadelphia did a, a case on judges there. Uh, the uh, Philadelphia did. Detroit, uh, I know, considered it. And... Uh, Cleveland had one going on while Greylord was going on. So there were other cases. New York's had a they might have some spawned problems. Them. They spawned them. Yeah, like Greylord is still considered one of the FBI's most successful yes. undercover cases and most successful public corruption cases to this day. And you were the undercover so man. Undercover so man. you are the legendary <laughs> Terry Hake. There's no doubt about that. I was uh, the man. Uh, as a matter of fact, I want to thank Director Mueller, the current director of the FBI. He